Man, you can see it's a pretty busy morning here at the Dandridge boat ramp out on Douglas Lake. There's actually a BFL out here on Saturday. You can see, I mean, really, really busy ramp. This is where I grew up fishing, and this is what I've dealt with my whole life. I mean, this is a great lake, it's a great fishery, but it gets a ton of pressure. And that is part of the reason I'm the angler that I am, and I use the baits that I use. So let's go out here, spring of the year, cool water temps, balsa crankbaits, what's gonna be tied on the end of my line. It's really neat with the water down, how you can, you can visualize above what's going on below. And then you imagine how that side image, 360, any of those other imaging, how they, work with the contour of the land as well. It's a neat thing with that 360 is you're working, working in and out of these places, you really see how the angle and the, the drop or whatever, which way it picks up that return a little better. Being able to see what's on the shoreline tells you generally what's gonna be underneath of it and whether it's a slick point or a point that's got a good vein of rock on it. Then you can use your 360 to really see exactly where to cast, which ones to just keep a motor on six or seven and get on by. When people come to a lake like Douglas that aren't used to, you know, this type of reservoir, Highland Reservoir, especially one that fluctuates as much as this place does, they look at these shorelines, especially coming here when the water's down. And I've had people make the comment to me that it, it looks like they're fishing on the moon <laughs> because there's not much in the water for those, you know, those fish to be on most of the year. There's no grass, very little wood, just occasional stump here or there. When the lake's up, there's buck bushes and willow trees and flooded trash piles and you know other stuff. But when it's like this, or the lake's drawn down even further, I guess it would be aching to fishing on the moon. You know, just a lot of these slick kind of places. But if you look at this point, totally featureless. I mean, a nice rounded, pretty shaped point, a very defined point, but really nothing else on it. Even looking at my imaging right here, there's nothing else out there in the water. It's exactly what you see on the shoreline where take that point for example, you've got a nice really pretty vein of slate and just like it is over there on this 45 degree bank, that stuff is actually running on out into the water. And that's the way it does on most of these places. It'll run much like that point back there where it goes up one side, across the point and right back down the other. And it'll go nearly all the way to the bottom of those valleys. Then you've got a valley in the middle that's typically just kind of softer bottom and then it will come up the other side. But those, places like that, those little key veins of rock, those are veins of rock that, you know, run out from shallow to deep most times. Those are the little key places that you can run spot to spot to spot and figure out a pattern. Are they on, you know, slate rock points that are secondary? Are they on ones out on the main channel? Are they on ones that have a little crown to them that maybe are actually on a high spot or something? And then figuring out just exactly what depth, if they're in six to eight feet of water, if they're in 25 feet of water, Wherever those little um, slate veins are set up, you know, to where those, where those fish are usually making to the depth. A big, big thing, and it always has been any time of the year on Highland Reservoirs, not just in East Tennessee, but throughout the country, is your weather. The, I mean, these fish are extremely weather dependent. A day like today, cloudy, a decent little breeze, this is a good fishing day. You come out here when it's sunny, it's slick, a really beautiful day in the springtime, you'd really be better off bird watching and trying to catch bass. I mean, it's just, those fish just do not cooperate, but you catch a really nasty, wind blowing, cloudy, ugly day, man, those can be the very, very best for fishing. And it's, it's really unbelievable, the difference. If you've never experienced it, you'll come out here on one of those days when it's almost miserable to be fishing, but the fish are biting so good that you really just don't care. And then you'll come back on the very next day or two days later and you'll swear there aren't any fish in the lake. You'll, you can't believe the difference. And it, I mean, it's just, it's all weather dependent. That's the way these lakes are. So you really just got to take advantage of those kind of marginal days when you think, you know, is it worth going to the lake? Yeah, it, it absolutely will be. And then on those really pretty days, go do something with a wife and kids. Don't worry about going fishing then. These edges and the way that, I mean, where you've got just a plain bank, then it comes into that nice big jagged slate. Consider this to be a grass lake, and that's the edge of the grass line right there. Consider it to be a lake that's got a row of stumps, and that's the edge of the row of stumps. It's exactly the same thing for those bass. They use those places as their edge, as their feeding zone. That's their habitat, that's their home, and that's where they're comfortable, is on that place where you've got a little bit of cover, 
and then they've got a nice clean area to feed off of. Bass are gonna use whatever they've got available on our lakes, these highland reservoirs. It's rock, and they're gonna use that rock as their cover and as their feeding habitat. There's a little one. He's not terrible. Not real big, but not real small. Something to get started just on this kind of little end of this straight, uh, straight, real slaty place. Kind of where it breaks up here at the end. And that bait was down there ticking the bottom about five feet and then just kind of came off the bottom a little bit and that, that fella right there grabbed it. <clears throat> really just trying to get the, you know, get it figured out exactly where these fish are holding at right now. Are they inside these pockets or are they on the main channel still? And a lot of times, you, you know, you may find out that some of the smaller fish are back in and the big ones are still out or vice versa. You just got to work through here and, and try to pick off a few here and there and you'll figure out exactly where the, uh, where the better ones are holding. If I had a jig out, something that goes hand in hand for me this time of the year with, you know, with cranking this shad wrap would be flipping a jig into this stuff right here. I don't actually have one out right now, but that is something that in a tournament scenario, I'd come up to a lay down like this. I would lay my shad wrap down, pick up my pros jig, and then flip in a big, a big nasty lay down like that. It's definitely a good one-two punch for that springtime early pre-spawn fishing. Late winter, early pre-spawn for me, I don't look at it that much different than I do the rest of the year. I've got to pick up a tool to start with that I can cover water and try to establish a pattern as to where those fish are holding. Whether they're main lake oriented, they're starting back in the pockets, or even if it's a warm water feed deal that's going on maybe in the backs of the pockets. But that tool for me to start off with so many times when that water's in the upper 40s is a shad wrap. Number five, number six, number seven, even a number eight shad wrap. But that shad wrap is something I can fish, I can cover water with, it's not extremely slow. I'm not burning it down the banks, but I can cover water with it and really be able to figure out quickly where those fish are holding. And it's a great bait to be able to actually land those fish with as well. Our lakes that I grew up fishing are such good pattern lakes. You know, they've got a lot of rock, a lot of transitions, a lot of gravel, slaty type banks, but you're able to put together a pattern most days out here, especially this time of the year. I mean, this is a, a great time of year to pattern fish anywhere in that late winter, early pre-spawn time. But our lakes really, just really fit that mold extremely well. You can figure out, you know, the inside of a secondary point or the a main channel rocky point that's a really steep one, whatever that pattern is, once you get it put together, you're able to duplicate it in a lot of places. You know, I, I look at lakes out in the Ozarks that to me fish a, a lot similar. Um, you know, they're extremely good pattern lakes. It's not that one part of the lake is that much better than the rest. The whole lake is pretty good. Some lakes you go to, take a Gunnersville for example. If I was fishing on Gunnersville this time of the year, I would be on the upper part of the lake. You know, from like the BB Comer Bridge down to about North Salty. That's the section of the lake I like the best. I wouldn't fish anywhere else there. But on a lake like Douglas, Cherokee, Table Rock, you can catch them from one end to the other. The whole lake's good. You just gotta find a section that's got, you know, good wind, the color water that you wanna be fishing in, and then go. Whether it's this pocket or the next pocket or one four miles down, they're all good. Another thing that'll happen on our lakes, especially when they're fairly clean, and I would call this water for us, it's fairly clean, but you get a good breeze blowing like this and it just lasts all day, just keeps beating on these muddy shorelines. We've got a little bit of it already starting right here, but it'll create a really good mud line. Those fish will use that mud line actually as cover but you really need it to get built out off the bank to where it's out there and reach it into that about, if it is reaching into the five foot depth range, man, I have really, really caught them out of those mud lines before. It's just a, a great ambush place. Those bass can sit right up there in that dirty water and then wait for some, some bait or something to come by just in the edge of that clean and they'll just ambush out and get them. They use that mud line just like grass, in my opinion. I mean, they'll, they'll get right in there and kind of bury up in that stuff and just wait on something to come by the edge of it and man, they'll just absolutely smoke it. There's one. Right on the side of that boat ramp. Put the little shad wrap. Well, those boat ramps spring of the year are dynamite. 
You can tell that's a Douglas Lake bass. You see his black tail? Well, all these fish here have tattoos. You'll see that on a lot of these fish out here. And you can see their tails. A lot of them have, you know, whether it's on the tail or a dot on their head or whatever, they, uh, they've got, got some markings and tattoos on them and stuff. Trying to put together a little bit of something out here right now. A lot of pressure, a lot of boats out here fishing. But this time of the year, man, you're liable to catch four or five like that and catch a really, really great big one. But both of the fish so far have been on points and just, you know, little, little places where there's a difference in the rock, not just down these slick mud banks, not down a gravel bank. It's got to be a place where there's something breaking it up a little bit. That's where they've come from. For me, my love of fishing a shad wrap goes back to being a really young boy just fishing around here in East Tennessee. And honestly, the first five pound bass, as well as the first seven pound bass, I mean, two, as a bass angler, those are two sizes of fish that when you catch those fish, you never forget them. But both of those fish I caught were on a shad wrap, a number five shad wrap even. The number five, uh, the five pounder that I caught on it was actually on a perch shad wrap down on Watts Bar Lake in a tournament. And that first seven pounder I caught was on Lake Eufaula in a tournament as well. Actually, I never started that I was fishing down there. So my, my love for fishing a shad wrap goes way, way, way back beyond my affiliation with Rapala. I mean, I've been fishing these baits for forever. I mean, my whole fishing career has been using a shad wrap and they're just such a staple bait for anglers all across the country. You know, primarily a, a cooler water bait, but it certainly works in a lot of different situations. And it's a great bait, not just for bass. I mean, we would fish them all the time in the rivers down here for white bass and for other species and walleye as well. Everything that eats bait fish will eat a shad wrap at some point in time. If you look at the profile of a shad wrap, if you lay a shad right beside that thing, it is almost exactly the same. I mean, they're laid out, their shape is basically identical. But then a shad wrap being a flat-sided balsa wood bait, that balsa wood is so lively, such a lively material. If you took this exact thing, molded it in plastic, it's not gonna run anywhere close to the same, to be quite honest. But with that round lip sticking out of the nose of it, just a little bit of turn down angle that achieves that, that diving depth and that diving action that we want out of it to where it's got just a really nice shimmy just exactly what those cold water shad look like. Just a little bit of roll, a little bit of wiggle back and forth. And it's that, that wiggle, that tight action is what those cold water bass really feed on. In a shad wrap, I keep my color selection pretty simple. I've got some loud colors. I'll carry some fire tiger and you know some different stuff occasionally. But for me, the three that I really fish the most would be silver, shad, and then crawdad. Those are really the three colors that I fish the very most. The silver is the one I'm gonna use in the clearest water on the brightest days or extremely pressured fish, but I feel like I know they're eating bait fish. And the same with shad. Shad's gonna be when I know they're on bait, but I'll use that shad color in fairly dirty water. I mean, it has a really good pearly flash to the sides of it, but definitely a bait fish color. The crawdad, that's one that I'll use in fairly clear water, kind of surprisingly clear water, but I'll also use it in fairly dirty water. It really doesn't seem that the color of the water matters too much for crawdad. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I know those bass are eating a shad wrap in a crawdad color because they know it's a shad or they know it's a crawdad. I just know the color works. That's all I can tell you about that crawdad color is that it really, really catches them at times. So if I was going to tell you to go out and buy Three shad wraps, those would be the three colors I'd tell you to pick up. Crankbaits have, you know, by some people are labeled idiot baits. You throw it out, you reel it in, they don't think you do anything else with them. Anything with a diving lip on it, you know, could be put into that category, but it really couldn't be any further from the truth. There's so much more that goes into that retrieve than the bait hitting the water and me turning the reel handle until the bait's back to me again. I'm gonna make a, a fairly steady, slightly more aggressive retrieve to get that bait down to the bottom. As soon as I feel that first bottom contact and these cooler water temps, I'm gonna slow my retrieve down to where I can really feel, really get an idea of what's going on underneath the water down there as that bait's bumping along the bottom. Anytime I feel that bait deflect a little bit differently, hit a little bit bigger rock or a piece of wood, you know, pick up a piece of grass or anything in the water, I'm gonna change my retrieve. A lot of times that comes with a, just a little small twitch of the rod tip just to get that bait to dart, pause for a second, and then begin that retrieve again. That pause 
is when a lot of those strikes will come or just as you begin your retrieve again. If you imagine that bait hitting a rock, pausing, hanging there a second, and then going back again, that's a very, very good trigger for those bass that were either following the bait or actually were holding by that piece of cover that you bumped into. But I do like, for the most part, to use a fairly steady retrieve just with those intermittent pauses. A big thing to keep in mind on those pauses, I'm not talking about allowing the bait to sit there three or four seconds. It's just enough for the bait to stop wiggling and then start moving again. It's not like I do with a jerk bait where you jerk, jerk, pause, count to 10, jerk, jerk, pause. This is just a very slight hesitation of the reel handle enough to allow the bait to quit wiggling and then start retrieving the bait again. But there's one. Small mouth. Brown one grabbed it right at the boat. He's pretty fired up. Right out here on the main lake point. It's kind of a gravelly, gravelly little point. He's pretty excited about having bit the old shad wrap. Quit wiggling just a little bit. I don't want to put my hands in the water. It's too cold out there. A little crawdad shad wrap right there in his, in his mouth. He bit it right, I mean, right at the end of the cast. And you'll have that a lot of times with those fish that are, you know, they're holding out just a little bit deeper. Or maybe they followed the bait out to where it stopped making contact with the bottom anymore. As soon as that bait starts to turn up, that's when they'll strike. That turn up right there at the end of the cast is uh, definitely a triggering mechanism. It's really a lot better turn up than one you'd ever eat. I would never eat a turn up. Don't do that. Catch smallmouth on a shad wrap on the turn up. The thing about a shad wrap is that it is a small, lightweight bait. It does tumble some on the cast, and I'll never, ever throw it on a bait casting outfit. Even the number eight, I throw on spin and tackle. A seven to seven foot two inch medium or medium light action rod is what I use it on. Want a good quality spinning reel. I like like a size 30 that holds a good amount of eight pound test fluorocarbon line. All the stuff I use comes from Bass Pro Shops, the Johnny Morris carbon light rod, carbon light reel, and XPS fluorocarbon line for that. But having a really good quality parabolic spinning rod is gonna help you get more bites, get the bait out there further, then also land more of those bites. If you're using too fast of an action on, a, on your rod, you're gonna get those bites that just don't quite eat the bait good enough. That's why you really want a nice soft rod to allow those cold water fish to engulf that shad wrap really, really well.